Hey everybody and welcome to another tutorial from Electronic Armory. Today we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to build an application from start to finish. I'll show you the different steps that we take to build an application that is fully robust and scalable at the same time. So the application that we're going to be building today is a fully featured application that is going to take multiple locations from a web service, namely a static JSON object, pull that into the application, parse it, add those objects to the database, and we're going to display that both in a map view and in a table view controller as well. We're also allowing the user to add their own locations. You can add the pin here. And without any references back to the table view controller, we automatically display that here at the top. And so we'll show you how to build this application out using proper software engineering techniques. And hopefully you can use these techniques in your own applications. So let's get started. This application will cover a lot of different things. It'll cover core data, JSON parsing, locations, maps, table views, notification center, web services, tab bar controllers, and much, much more. So this tutorial is gonna be a little bit long, way longer than anything I've put together before, but hopefully you get a lot out of this because you'll see how the creation process happens from start to finish. So hopefully you stick with it and you watch from beginning to end, but we're gonna start out with prototyping the application. Normally I would do this in either an application that's dedicated to prototyping or simply just start it out with paper and a pencil and just start sketching and drawing out the different screens. The way that I'm gonna show you today is a little bit of a quick and dirty method, but it is pretty effective. We're gonna use storyboards. And the application that we're going to develop is going to have as its first screen a map as its second screen, it's gonna have a table view and the map is going to show building locations and the second table view will show those locations, but instead of being on a map, it'll show them in the table view. And these locations will come from a server and that server will serve up some JSON. We'll parse that JSON, we'll store it in core data and we'll use locations and GPS to uh, show where the user is and Notification Center will allow us to coordinate between these different views, and the tab bar controller will allow us to select each one of those views. So what this is going to look like, when well, we're gonna prototype this out, I'm gonna create another view controller here, and down here I'm just gonna type in map and drag in a map view as our initial view. And the reason why we make this an initial view and not a you know, the, the second view is because we want to make sure that the user is entering the application with the most useful view possible. And that's going to be the map view. If you're showing them the table view, it's going to be a little less intriguing for them. And so for this one, we're going to set up our auto layout and we're going to hold down the control key, select from map view here and do leading, trailing, vertical to bottom and vertical to top. And again, that'll kind of control our layout here. For this one, for the, the table view, I'm going to actually delete this and include a table view for right now. This is just the easiest method. I could drop in a table view manually. All right, so if you remember from the previous video to set up our table view properly, we have to go ahead and select our cell here and just make sure that we're giving it a reuse name uh, if I can actually select the, um, let's see. It's always a little tricky trying to select the actual um, cell here for, here it is. Make sure that we have the reuse identifier. And for this one, I'm just gonna type in cell. You can name it whatever you want. If you have multiple cells, you can define that a little bit more clearly. Okay, so we have a table view here and a map view here. So this view controller corresponds to this view controller here. Oh, sorry about that, main view controller. And then this table view does not currently have a view controller associated with it. We'll create that in a second, but at this stage, we're still prototyping it. Now, as I mentioned, we wanna wrap this in a table, uh, tab bar controller, excuse me. So we click on this, and now you can see that we have now embedded these two views. Actually, this one is first, and this one should be second. And by selecting the item down here, we can rename this. I'm just gonna call it map, 
And for down here, I'm going to select this one and call it list. And make sure that our map is first on the left and our list is here. You can always drag these around so that the list is first in case you switch those around. But again, we want the map to be first. All right, and so that does it there. What I want to do is actually allow the user to add their own location. And so I'm going to drag this down so that we have room to add a button here. And if you notice, everything turned orange, and that's because we've now redefined our layout. And the auto layout's telling us that this is now 47 pixels more than where we're going to put it. And so this dotted line is where it is going to actually be when we compile our application. So if you want this line, the actual view where it is now to be the exact spot and not this dotted line, we make sure that we go down to our constraints here and we select for the selected view, which is our map view in this case, that we want to update the constraints. And that gets rid of that orange and shows that we have this constraint set up that is going to define how low below this top vertical that goes. So I'm going to add a button here. You'd be a little bit more, you know, design savvy. I'm just going to say add, make that button a little bit more, uh, you know, better. <laughs> Let's see, so I have another view controller that we want to add for that add button. And this view controller is going to have several different text views in it. So let's do text. So here's our text fields. And what we're going to allow the user to do is create a new location with a name. So let me add a label here. And I'm going to control drag or option drag, I guess, sorry. Double click on these, so name. And we're gonna allow this user to add a description. And of course, we're still on the prototyping phase, so we're not gonna make this too pretty. I accidentally, so we wanna hit button. And so we're gonna have a save button here that actually allows us to save the location and that we should be good there. Okay, so when we tap this button here, this add button, we're going to select, have it select this, or excuse me, have it show this view controller. So we wanna do just show and that'll create a segue from this button down to this view. But we also want to do the same thing to the table view. We want to have an add button there as well. We'll get to that in a second if we have time. But for right now, we're going to just keep it this way. All right, so uh, when I hit that save button, well, well, we'll save up the code for right now. Let me just go ahead and compile this and see if this runs. Okay, and so what I forgot to do when I set up this project is add our map kit. So that's what that error means down here. You could read it, but basically it means that we did not add our map kit. So there's a couple ways we can do this, and you can see I've already added something to set this up. We'll get to that in a second. But just go down to maps here, turn that on, and that's all we have to do. Recompile that and run it. And again, we're still on our prototyping phase. Okay, so that handled that. If we go to our list view, you see that there's nothing there because we don't have that set up yet. But when we go add it, you can see that it does add the detailed text view with our text fields. And we can save it, but that doesn't do anything. And we have no way to get back out of this view. So that's pretty good. That's essentially what our app is going to do. Now, there's a few things that we need to handle for these. Now if we go to back to our main storyboard because this is a nice view of how we you know look at our application. So we have a two view app with these tabs and we have the map view and the table view. So this looks pretty good for a prototype as I said and this is what we want to kind of go with. Now Let's take a look at this because we have a lot of underlying technologies that we have to deal with. Number one is the core data aspect of it. 
we want to be able to download some buildings in this case. It could be any kind of data, data, of course. And we're going to download that from a server. And so what we're going to need to do is have some kind of web services. And then when we get that JSON data, we have to parse that JSON data. And then we're going to store it in a database. Now, this is going to be kind of tricky, but I'll walk you through it step by step. And so let's just start out with what we know. We know we need to have a core data database. And so I've started this project with that core data database checkbox already enabled when I start the project. And what that does is it adds a bunch of code to your app delegate. But what I've done is I ripped that out so you can see that there's nothing down here except for one thing. And I've put that into its own file here. And this file is essentially just a copy and paste of that code that gets put into your app delegate file. But I've added a couple things to make this a little bit more friendly. I've made the init function private because I don't want anybody creating an instance of my database controller. I've added the get context function and made it a class function. And what that does is that simply review, returns the persistent container view context, and that's going to be your managed object context. The persistent container, which loads in your database from a file, I've made that a static. And so there's only one exists and it's going to be a little bit more beneficial to your class as a static. And another class function called save context. And what this allows me to do is anywhere within the application, such as the app delegate, I can simply call database controller dot save context and that'll save whatever's in the managed object context and save that back down to disk. Likewise, anywhere in my application, if we go back to our database controller, I can call get context to either create an entity or save an entity or delete an entity or any of the above in combination. We can get this with just calling database controller dot get context and then calling either an insert or delete on an entity. So this is just going to help you manage your code a little bit better. The alternative is if you keep it in the app delegate method, it will, you have to get a reference not only to your app delegate, but you do that through an application and it, the, the lines of code that it takes to actually get that reference is quite long. And so this is the easiest way that I've found to handle this kind of stuff. I don't like to write a lot of code. So if I can reduce it, uh, that's a great benefit to me. Okay, so there's our database. It's already taken care of. We have a buildings manage ob or a data model that we have here. I haven't added anything to it. And then if we go to our buildings uh, under the general tab, you can see that I've added Alamo Fire. It added MapKit when I turned that switch on before. I've added the Alamo Fire, and this is going to take care of our web services. We'll get into the code here in a second. And the JSON parsing, we'll also use just the native iOS framework data for code for that. So let's get started with actually writing the code. What we want to do is make sure that we can download that file and parse it before we try to do anything architecturally. Normally, you would probably download this into some kind of object, like a class. And we will do that, but let's just go ahead and go to our trusty old view controller and go to our view div load. And the reason I'm doing this is, again, I just want to make sure that this is working before I pull it out and put it into an, a class because I know that this view div load is going to get called first. And so the thing that we need to do with Alma Fire is we need to import it wherever we're going to use it. And so I've already added it to the file, uh, just the manual adding. We're going to add the module and so now we can go ahead and add that and let's see so what we're going to do is first call alma fire if i can spell it right and in the alma fire library we call request and we have a couple options here so let me just finish typing this out So we have a request that we can just add a URL to. We can add a URL request to, which is a little bit more uh, advanced and flexible. And then we have another request that we add a URL, a method. So HTTP method, this is going to be a get or a put. 
We can add parameters to that. Well, we're just downloading a file and we're not really passing any parameters. So we're not going to use this. We're just gonna use the URL request. And the URL request is just simply, um, and actually I take that back. We're going to, uh, let's just put in this. Um, we can create a request object, but I think just for demonstration purposes, we'll do this. Now the file that we're going to download, we'll go ahead and copy that in. This is the file URL that we're going to copy in. The JSON object that we are going to parse is an array. So that's defined by the open square bracket, ending square bracket. And there's two objects in here. So this is the first object, comma separated. This is the second object, no trailing comma. And it has a bunch of key value pairs, namely name. And that name for this one is just Bronco Stadium. The next one is location, but instead of being a string, it's actually the value is another is another object. And inside of that object, we have another key value pair, latitude with a type of double, longitude with a type of double that's negative. And then finally, outside of that object, back in the, the root object, we have description. And that description of Bronco Stadium is blue turf. And so again, we have another object in there that is the same format as this previous object. Okay, so I am going to copy this URL and we're going to paste this in as a string to our Alamo request. Okay, so we have our URL that we're going to download and what we're going to do now is get a response string from this and there's a couple of different options that we can have and Alamo Fire will sometimes parse these things for us but if you're just not, if you're not dealing with JSON, the the one that you're probably wanting to do is, is the string, but you can also do data if it's an image or something like that. I'm gonna show you string here. So let me go ahead and hit enter on that. And for the completion handler, what we normally do is create a block here, but the shorthand for this that I actually kind of like, uh, you may differ in this, is just to do the response, which is the parameter that's getting passed into that block in and it's asking me to do a emoticon there. No, thank you. Nope. And then we end our curly brace here. And then now this is our code block that gets executed after the file has been downloaded and it's going to be contained in that response object. And so let me create a variable for that JSON response or I should say the JSON string that comes out of that response. So we're gonna have the response, and then inside of that response, we have a result. And inside of that result, we have a value that is a string, and that value could be nil, and so we're gonna unwrap it. Now, normally you'd probably just wanna make sure that this value, actually the, the response is of type 200, meaning that it was successful and not a 404 or something like that. All right, so now that we have the JSON string, we have to first convert it into data. So I'm gonna call that JSON data and set that equal to the JSON string object, but converting it to data using, and we're going to use the UTF-8 file format, and we can do string.utf8 UTF-8 here. Um, Actually, excuse me, it's going to use just that type there. So shorthand for just using the UTF-8 is just adding the dot because it knows what type to, to do in the first place. All right, so that is also potentially coming back as a nil object. So we're gonna unwrap that with a exclamation point. And the way that I know that is if I delete that and we go to the next line, um, it could potentially, let's see if I build this actually, it will should tell me um, okay, well, sometimes it pops up to say that this object could potentially be, or the, excuse me, the object that comes back here could potentially be nil. So let's leave that off for right now. Now, the next thing I need to do is we have the JSON data. We actually want an array, so I'm going to call that JSON array. And this is the, this is going to be an object that represents those two, op those two JSON objects that are contained in our JSON array. So call it JSON array. And for this one, we are going to do the JSON serialization. 
So just type in that. And the JSON serialization is going to take that JSON data object. So JSON object with data. Well, we already have this set up, so JSON data. And then the options that we're going to do, if I hit control forward slash to select the next placeholder, is the reading options. And we basically just type in what that placeholder is. So JSON serialization dot reading options. The reading options is a function. And so when we end this, we have to put into parentheses. And then finally, end that initial parenthesis. And we're going to typecast this as an NS array. Okay, so this whole line of code here is basically taking that string, parsing it, and returning an actual object, an array that we can use and that we can actually loop through. So let's create that loop right now. Let's do this really quickly. And we're going to say for the index that these objects have, you know, namely 0 and 1, and then what object is it going to be contained in? JSON object. And so each object, each one of those two in this case, that come out of our loop is going to be stored in the JSON object variable. And we're going to say in the JSON array that we're using. And so again, we're looping through the JSON array, but we need to enumerate through that. And so we're going to use the enumerated function that is provided in Swift 3. And so this is actually a new way of enumerating through um, an array in, in Swift using this kind of fast iteration uh, method. And so we have this here. Uh, I do have an error that popped up here. So uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Ah, okay. So I was right about the exclamation point. I can add it here or I can simply just unwrap it here so that I know that this object that comes back from this call is um, just fine. Um, okay, so the next error that we're getting is call con can throw, meaning it can throw an exception, and it is not marked by a try. And so we actually have to add a try, a try in here. And the way that we do that is when we go ahead and right before the JSON serialization, because if I try to pass in some ugly object there, it's going to throw an exception. And so we have to have a try in there that catches that exception. And since I do the, uh, have this try in here, I have to wrap all of this in a do. And so if I highlight this and then hit command uh, right square bracket, it'll indent that. And so then I can go ahead and just wrap this in a do. And we'll catch this here in a second. Um, And for the catch, I'm just going to print out the, the error. Well, there was an error. OK, so finally, let's see. We have this little warning price said that I'm not using it. And that's fine, actually. Probably might not use it in my case. But now everything's set up for our for loop to loop through each individual item. And the way that we want to loop through this is What's actually going to come back from each index in our array is a dictionary. And a dictionary is exactly what the JSON represents. It represents a key and a value. And sometimes that value can be another object or it can be a string. And so what we want to do is create another variable, kind of an intermediate variable. And I would just call this current building, which is each building that's coming out of here. And so Again, this is a type dictionary, and the way that we get that is we pull that out of the JSON object that we're looping through. And we're going to typecast that as a dictionary, and that dictionary is going to have a key of string and a value of, well, it could be a string or it could be an object. And so we're actually going to do any object for this, and we're going to end this kind of template or um, this guy right here. And so what I'm saying is the dictionary is going to have a key value pair and the key again is a string and the value is any object. Okay, and that'll typecast that 
that object that's coming out of that first index as a dictionary, which that's what we want. If I go back to our JSON object to show you what that looks like, this is the first, this is the JSON object that gets pulled out. Let me reduce this so you can see. Uh, Okay, so the JSON object that gets pulled out of our array is going to be represented this, and then the next time it loops through our loop here, it'll pull in this object. Okay, and so our object is now in our current building, and we can pull out the name and the location and the description from our current building using just simple dictionary methods. And so before I do that, I'm going to declare some constants and this is going to be the name key and that name key is going to be name and so again this represents this key here and this key as well and that's just for ease of programming so we the next one we have was the location now let me just uppercase all these and the location and i'm gonna just got copy from the json so i don't make a spelling mistake and the last one was a description key. This one. And the reason I'm doing that is so again, I don't have to type in the string every time. I can just use this, this variable and allow code complete to type the rest in for me. So a little bit of extra work goes a long way if saving me a lot of work later on. And so actually I forgot two more keys. We have the latitude key and I'm just going to call that latitude. It doesn't matter if I misspell the variable name, it just matters that I, oops, let the longitude key go back and just again make sure I copy that perfectly. And there we go. Okay, so now we have these keys, and I'll show you how to use these in a second when we're pulling out each of the, the different values for these. Now, I want to have a variable that actually contains that name, so I'm going to pull it out of the dictionary. And so we're going to have that current building, and we're going to pull it out using the uh, notation for dictionaries. And this has changed a lot over the years, especially with the different versions of Swift. But for this one, all you have to do is square brackets as if you're indexing an array. Yeah, if you're familiar with that notation, if not, then this is just how you pull out a value with a key from a dictionary. And we're going to have to typecast this as well as a string. And let me go ahead and just be explicit about the type of this. And then we have the location. And actually, let me save this for later. I'm going to pull out the description. String first, and that's of type string. And we're going to again use that dictionary object and pull out the key. You guessed it, description key, n square bracket. And we're going to pull that out as unwrap it string. OK, and so that's the easy part. Now, the little bit of the tricky part is the fact that the location is a latitude and longitude key value pair inside of it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pull this out into an intermediary dictionary, and then we're going to then pull out from that dictionary the latitude and longitude, just to show you how that works. So I'm going to have a location dictionary of type dictionary. And I'm going to set that and get that from our current building. And using the same notation, we're going to use that location key to pull it out. But instead of coming back as a string, it's going to come back as a dictionary. That dictionary, again, is going to have a key value pair of a string. And then as a, uh, I do believe it's just a double precision value. Because we can be a little bit more specific on the type that this is coming back as. Because for both our latitude and longitude, we know that these are, are doubles, or double push, uh, precision floating point variables. So uh, we now have our location dictionary. And now we can pull out. So let the latitude, which is a double, be equal to 
our location dictionary and the key that we use that is the latitude key and this is going to be pulled out as a double and see if it complains about that let longitude also double equal location dictionary oops location dictionary pull that out as the longitude key and we're going to typecast that value that comes back as a double okay so now what we have is besides the errors it's going to say insert the exclamation point um, yeah okay we can put it there uh, let's just be consistent and do it in the typecast okay those are just the warnings let's get past those warnings here in a second okay so now that I have all of my values I have the name the description and the latitude and longitude of my building I can then store that in a couple different places what I want to do is I want to create a pin for our map and so the way that we would do that is first to create a core location location coordinate 2d object and so let's go ahead and create that you'll see what that is in a second this is the actual location of the latitude and longitude and I'm gonna start typing in CL location but it's not going to autocomplete and that usually means that you don't have that library or that module imported so let's go ahead and do that core location okay and so once we do that we can now start typing in our core location coordinate 2d object and so the way that we make that is CL core location coordinate 2d um, but we also this is just the type but we want to make that and so we can type in make pulls up this autocomplete just go ahead and hit enter on that and now it's asking for a latitude and longitude and so this is simple as just filling in the blanks latitude and the next one is the longitude okay so now we have our core location object here and let's see this is still complaining about this well let's see let's get rid of these uh, let's take Xcode's suggestion on this all right we'll work through that um, all right so for that one what we're going to do is then go to the next line and now that we have our location as a core location 2d object we can now use that as a pin on our map and so um, we actually have to well we don't have to but it's a really good idea to create an annotation as a subclass and to do that we're going to create a new file so we're just going to go down here new file and I'm just going to call this one map pin just make sure it's a swift file okay we're going to add this to our buildings folder can call it map pin create this and to save you guys a little bit of time on this video I'm just going to copy in the code that I already have prepared and we'll go through it so I'm importing the map kit module so that we can use some of these different um, other classes like MK or map kit annotation this is going to inherit from NS object and the class name is map pin and the most important things that we have in here is the title the subtitle and the coordinate these have to be named exactly as they are shown here you can't just make up your own variable names because these are going to match and override uh, the map kit annotation protocol that it's expecting that the map kit is expecting it's going to look at your map pin class ask it for its title its subtitle and its coordinate in order to display the pin properly the other thing I have in here is just a quick initializer it's going to take in the title the subtitle and coordinate to initialize this pin so you can do it in one step and so what does that look like let me go ahead and save that and go back to the view controller so now that we have again the name the description and the location we can now create a map pin and so we're going to let our 
current map pin, which is of type map pin, just to be explicit. We're going to use that constructor. So map pin, and it's going to accept these three objects. So the title, we're going to use the name string as the title. So I'm going to copy that, control forward slash, and command paste. And then for the next one, the description string is going to be the subtitle. So command forward slash for that one, or control forward slash, excuse me. And then finally, for the coordinate, it's asking for that coordinate location 2D, which we passed or we got as this object here. And there we go. Okay. So I've done a bunch of different steps to pull out that data from a JSON object, which is just represented as a dictionary after being getting that from the serializer, which creates that object after downloading it from the internet. Essentially, this could be anything, any JSON object or an API REST endpoint. But what's going to happen is when your application runs this code, it's going to actually step over this entire piece of code and continue on with your application. And then maybe a second or half a second or even a quarter of a second or less later, it'll then execute what's inside of here. And so we can't really expect the UI or anything to, to wait on this. And so we're going to do a couple of things after we ensure that this is working. And so the final step for this after we've created that pin is just simply add it to the map. Well, currently I don't have a reference to that map. And so let's go ahead and do that now. I'm going to open up this inspector, or excuse me, the assistant here. I'm going to click on our storyboard so that we bring up our, our map view. Um, option command zero to get rid of that sidebar. And then I'm going to control drag from our map view to up here so that we can create a reference to our map view. Okay, so now that we have the map view, name of this guy here, we can go down to all the bottom of our for loop and again this is gonna be executed twice for our example and the map view we're gonna want to add that pin and it's not coming up because we haven't added the map kit module so just type that in so now that we should have that code and I don't know why Xcode always insists on giving me an error so now if I go ahead and type that in again you can see that it's going to add, we have a couple add methods in here, but the one that I want to actually do is the um, add pin, or excuse me, the add annotation, and it's right here. Pins are called annotations. Uh, I use those interchangeably, but they're visually represented as a pin. Um, we have two of them here so we can add a single annotation or we can add an array. For this one, we're just going to add them as we go. And that's going to be fine for this one. Um, actually, I chose the wrong one. Let me hit escape and pull that back up. So we just want to add the single one. So the difference is add annotations versus add annotation singular. And then simply just put in that current map pin variable that we created. And let's go ahead and save that. Almost ready to run this. We have an error here. Oh yes, okay, so because we are in the block, namely this callback, this request in block that this returns, map view is actually not part of this class, so we have to use self to get the reference there. And so again, just let Xcode do that for you. Just add self there, but that's why we're adding self. Uh, it's good to understand why Xcode's doing it, but sometimes it's just easier just to accept what it's telling you. Um, okay, so we have that and we should be ready to run our code, but I do want to put in a couple of breakpoints here, namely right before that gets called and right before this gets called. And this is a pretty uh, common practice for me just to make sure everything's working the way that I've expected it to. I'm just going to say called Alamo fire And I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. And it should almost immediately get caught on that initial breakpoint. And let's switch over to our simulator and let this load up. Okay, so even before our simulator was able to load, 
we get this call, this line of code that gets called here. Let me expand this so you can see it. Okay, so what's going to happen, or maybe what you might expect to happen, is when I step over this code, it would go to this line and start parsing our JSON. Well, that's not what's going to happen. It's going to jump down past all of that, print, display our map, and then eventually, sometime in the future, it'll go ahead and, and call this code. So let's go ahead and see if it does that. So hit the play button, and indeed, it jumps past that code. Hit the play button again. Our application continues our map loads, and then sometime in the future, which was about half a second to a second there, uh, we are going to uh, get this, well, I could tell you right now it's going to be an error, and I'll tell you why in a second, but if we investigate this response object, we can take a look at it by just holding it over, and we can see that the response is actually nil, and the result is a failure. And so if I go ahead and try to parse this, it'll give me a error and then my application basically crashes. The reason is because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to download a file over HTTP and not HTTPS. And so I have a quick fix for this. Uh, this is just the website that I have set up. I don't have HT or I don't have SSL enabled on this website. So the quickest way that I found to get around this that is to go ahead and uh, just put everything on the S3 bucket. And I have basically that here. So this is the S3 bucket. It's not as nice of a URL, but you can put up your own one. And I have a slightly different data in here. There's actually three in here, so a little bit different. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace this for now. And again, that has that HTTPS. And here's the error that happens. When I see this error, I know that it's trying to download HTTP code or data, and iOS by default does not allow that to happen. There is a, a workaround that you can put in exceptions for different websites, but um, again, this is just the, the more proper way of actually encoding, making sure your data is encoded using SSL. Okay, so again, S3 will allow you to have that SSL automatically and the storage is really, really cheap, so I highly recommend it. Let's go ahead and rerun that. Okay, so I guess it already hit the breakpoint there. So for this one, again, we're going to play over this. This is going to get called. I'm going to remove this breakpoint now that you guys get the point. Hit play through that, and then sometime in the future, you know, again, get rid of that. Now if we look at a response object, we can see that we have a actual response. Our data is 402 bytes. And if I remember correctly, that's about the size of our JSON file up on that server. And the result is success. And so again, if you were doing this proper error checking, you would probably check that result to make sure it's success. I know I was supposed to go through an entire application, but if I polish this all off, it would take days <laughs> and not the hour or so that I plan on doing this. Okay, so we have that, that's great. We're gonna step over this code. We're gonna make sure that our JSON string looks appropriate. And so this is what it looks like, and that's great. You know, all those kind of formatting characters in there, that's fine. Uh, our JSON data, you won't see anything in here. It just shows you it's 402, has a bunch of garbly gook in it. Step over that. Now we have a JSON array and it has three elements in it. And if you remember, that's exactly what we want from our from our data that comes back. The new data that I had actually had three objects in it. And each one of those has three key value pairs. And we can even expand these to see what they look like. Name, location, description. And so as we debug this application, we can see that our data does represent what we thought it does. Or if your application crashes, you can see that maybe somebody's stuck in a different key and you're trying to look up a key that doesn't exist or what have you. So we'll go through this one. I'll put another breakpoint here, remove this breakpoint and go through this one. And so we're going to pull this out as a JSON object to our current building. Again, this is a dictionary with each one of those value pairs in it. We're going to step through this real quick. So this is our first step that we're going to take our building and pull out the value using that key and indeed our name string is bronco stadium our description string is blue turf our location dictionary if we look at that 
is a two key value pair. So you see that our first one is longitude with a negative double value, and our next one is latitude with a double value here. So let's just step over each one of those and make sure that our double is indeed what we think it is. Now with the floating point precision, you will get some of these little kind of precision errors, uh, and that's okay for, for our purpose anyway. You probably want to either truncate that or handle that appropriately, but we can debug this and see that we do have a little bit of a rounding error there, and that's just the nature of doubles. Okay, so next line of code. We're creating that coordinate 2D object, so when we uh, stick that in here, we can have our name, our description, and our location, which has a location, latitude, and longitude for that. And that's going to create our pin. We can step into that, see what our initializer looks like. Uh, step into that, that, those are just the getters um, to get those values. And so inside of our initializer, we have the title which is Bronco Stadium, subtitle, blue turf, and our coordinate with the latitude and longitude. And actually if I hit the, no, if this one stays up, with the eye, it should show us a map. And so, yeah, that looks perfect. That's, uh, it's not called Bronco Stadium anymore, it's called Aberson Stadium, but that's okay <laughs> and so if we go ahead and look at our map we can see that that's exactly the location we want thank you quick look let's close that and now we know that all of our data is getting populated appropriately and this will return us back and we step over this line of code and surely we now have an object uh, with all those populated and so this is just great to do as a first run so that i know my code works here and then finally, I'm going to add that to the map view. And I'm going to hit the play button. That's going to go loop through again. And that's going to pull out our second object and put that on the map. And then I hit it one more time. That's going to pull out our third object and put it on the map. And so if I hit play the third time, it pulls up our uh, map here. And I should actually zoom in here. And indeed, it added those pins to the map. So, perfect. Now, our next step is, well, let's just check our pins to make sure that indeed we have the Moore Center and the Wood Turf. That's a basketball stadium. This is just a random one I added later. And this is our Bronco Stadium Blue Turf that we added here. Okay, so perfect. And okay, if we go back to our list view, you can see that that's not populated. So let's go ahead and add that really quickly. So for our main story board, let me close this. We have this list view, and the list view is going to be dependent on the buildings that come back and get parsed. So what we need to do is we're doing that in here. We need to share that with this object. But let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up and make this an actual table view. So I'm going to create a new Swift file to be the view controller for this. And we're going to call this simply just table view controller. Okay, so this is the file that it created. It's going to ask us, um, well, basically it's an empty file. And so I want to immediately just start putting in UI kit there. And the class name that we're going to enter in has to be table view controller. Okay, and that's going to inherit from the UI table view controller. And it is going to, let's see, actually I think that's all we have to do for that because it automatically asks for the delegate and data source uh, protocols that we're going to implement right here. And so the way that we do that is setting up table view. You can look at a previous video on how to set this up with more detail, I'm just gonna fly through this pretty quickly. So uh, let's see if it comes up. Oh, okay, sorry, this class name is not UI table view, it's just table view, which is the name of this guy here. 
So now that we get the class name correct, our autocomplete works. And so as I type in table view, we get all of our data source and delegate methods that we have to input. And the one that I want is first, how many sections are in our, um, in our table? And so we can look at this um, section, number of sections in table view. Okay, for this one, we're just going to have one section. Oops, and it looks like the autocomplete kind of did a few things for me. Okay, and the next one is the number of rows. So actually, let me just type in number of rows. And we get this one here. That's the one we're looking for. And the number of rows is going to be dependent on the number of buildings that we have in the array. Well, we don't have access to that just yet. But again, I'm going to hard code some of this. And I'm just going to say, I know we have three. So let's just go ahead and return three. And then finally, oh yeah, we have to implement that function. Yep, override, thank you. Uh, and this one is also the same. Let me just type this in so we don't have to let Xcode do it for us. And the next one where we're going to do is it's going to ask us for the cell. So table view, I'm just going to type in cell for here. So the cell for row, what this cell actually looks like. And again, Xcode decided to do a whole bunch of filling in for me and that's fine. So the way that we're going to do this is we have to first create the cell. This is of type UI table view cell. And that's going to be equal to the table views DQ reusable cell. And if you remember at the video, the beginning of our video, we just named that cell when we actually were doing our prototype setup. I always forget to do that. So I always set that up as soon as I can because I always forget to do it. So, uh, yep, please unwrap that for me. And what we could do is simply return the cell at this point because it is asking for a return type of UI table view cell, which is obviously this guy. But we also want to do its text label and set that equal to just test. And the reason I do this is because I want to make sure that my table view is all set up and working before I go ahead and try to set up or link the data to it. Now our table view cell doesn't have that class associated with it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So just start typing that in. If this doesn't come up, you've done something incorrectly. So there we go. And just to make sure we want to make that table view, if we go up to the list, make sure that our data source and delegate are both selected for the outlets from our table view to that controller. Okay, so let's just go ahead and compile that and see if we have everything working. Switch back over to our simulator as that compiles. All right, so our map loaded up there. I'm gonna delete or yeah, remove that breakpoint because we know that works. Go over to our list and indeed our list does have three rows in it. So that's all working great, perfect. And so is our map. Now the trick is to get these pins that have all that data into our, into our table view. And so you might have an application that you've done all the logic in your one view and you have to get it to another view that shares that same data. Well, I could copy and paste all this code and put it into my table view as well, but that's very redundant. It's error prone. It's CPU intensive when it doesn't need to be. And so the way that we do that is we put it into a third object that both views control or have access to. And so we are going to refactor this code. We're going to pull it all out and I'm going to cut it out and create a new third file. This with file again, I'm going to call this locations or excuse me, uh, let's do buildings controller. And this is going to control all of our business or buildings objects. And so we're okay with foundation. We're going to create a class called exactly that buildings controller and we're going to inherit from the NS object 
And for this one, we are going to have a buildings array. So I'm going to say, well, let's make it a variable just in case we want to change it. So variable buildings array. This is going to be of type, let's just make it that. And we're going to set this equal to an NS array object from the very get-go and we're going to make it a static variable because we only want to have one of these arrays lying around. And the next thing I want to do is give this class the ability to control the data that comes in and out of our buildings controller. We want to give access to other objects, uh, give access to the buildings in this array, but we don't want to just be able to, to hand this array over and say, hey, just do whatever you want with the data because that's very error prone. We want to control and encapsulate this data. And so one of the ways that we can do this is creating a class function. And we can say, um, excuse me, we don't want to use get um, for this, but say buildings array. Um, actually, let me call this shared buildings. And this is going to pass back a NS array object. And we're going to return just a buildings array, which is namely this guy. Now this already automatically has a getter set up with this. Uh, let's see what this error is. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So that one, uh, this building array just gets passed back. What you could do is pass back a copy of this array so that if anybody another class, let's say, edits that array. It doesn't edit the original array, but we're going to keep this pretty plain and simple for right now. And then we're also going to add another class function. And I'll show you why we do this in a second. And we're going to say add buildings, or actually add building, and that's going to accept a building of type. And we're just going to use map pins because that's pretty common, a common object that we can pass around. Um, it has a title, a description, and an actual GPS location. So we're just going to go ahead and use that. And again, that's a map pin type. And what we're going to do is have that buildings array. We can add um, that object, and that object is going to be just that building. All right, so we've added a place for our buildings but we haven't actually added a place for downloading our data and putting it into that building array. So let's go ahead and do that. And what I'm going to call this is load buildings. Okay, it's not going to accept any arguments or parameters. It's not gonna have a return type. And this is where I'm going to paste that code in that we cut out from the original view controller. And again, it's going to complain about the Alamo Fire that we do not have imported yet. So let's import Alamo Fire. And that's going to remind me just to clean up my code here and remove this, but also these guys as well. So because basically we're back to having an empty view controller. We'll get to that in a second. And then if we go back to our buildings controller where we were, um, it is going to ask for this location coordinate 2D, so we're just gonna paste that back in. And now we no longer have a map kit reference. And so we're gonna take this out because our buildings controller should not know anything about the UI. Just uh, you know, talking about responsibilities of classes, this class should not know anything about that. And so you're left with this unused variable for your current map pin. So let's go ahead and copy that. And instead of putting it on the map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into that buildings array, but I'm gonna do so uh, through that through that class. And so what we can do is buildings, or, oh, excuse me, buildings controller dot add building. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second or maybe in a few minutes when we get down a little bit deeper. But this way, whenever I add a building, it's going to call this function, and I might have other code in here that every time I add a building, I want to actually run some other code in addition. And again, that's why we kind of abstract this to its own class. Okay, so add building. Every time that map pin gets created, it'll add it to the array. And so now we have an array generated 
sometime after this is downloaded and parsed. And if we go back to our view controller, what we can do is load buildings, and that'll start to load the process. But what will happen is, oh, and I actually took out that import for the map kit that I shouldn't have. So I get rid of that error. So we want to do this as soon as we can. We don't want to actually wait for this view to load before we start loading the buildings. We want to do that as soon as possible. So we're going to actually go to the app delegate and we're going to go into the did finish launching. This means our application did finish launching. None of our views are ready at this point, but we're going to go ahead and just start that loading process. And that loading process, again, doesn't have any reliance on views. It's happening in the background. We don't want to control any of the views, any of the UI elements in the background. So again, at the earliest possible moment, we're going to load that file. And then in our view controller, that, that array might not actually exist. So let's try it. So buildings controller, getting the buildings array. We're going to put that into just a, a temporary reference here. So we're going to just store this into our own buildings array. Okay. So um, this would actually be the function. Um, oh, okay. This is the, it's called the shared buildings. Come up with something a little bit more creative. Okay, yes, sorry. Lots of blue dryer coming up. Okay, so buildings array is now hopefully has some elements in it. So let's go ahead and create a um, an iterative loop here to just loop through all these different buildings. Um, this is going to be, let's see, a building. Uh, let's call it a map pin actually in the building array. And these are gonna come back um, let's see, so uh, these are going to come back as um, map pins. And then, of course, we have to use the enumerated here. Okay, so this, um, okay, what's the error? Let's just do this for right now. So this map pin is going to be the current map pin and we have the reference to our map view already. And so we're just going to add the annotation and this map pin is going to be that annotation. And I don't know if this is going to give me an error, which it probably will because we haven't properly typecast this. Uh, so what yeah, I usually like to do is instead of calling this map pin, I'm going to call it current well, let's say it's a current object because that's what it is. It's it's some type of object. We don't know what it is. I'm just going to say this is the current pin and this is equal to that current object as a map pin. And replace that. And let's go ahead and build that, see if that works for us. And it failed. And it's saying cannot convert the value of type offset in any to type map pin in coercion. Well, that's interesting. Let me go ahead and just type in what I have and accept the Xcode defaults. Okay, and so again, this Xcode is nice and helpful for this. I'm not using the index for this. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and replace it with that placeholder. Okay, so now that we have that all it in there. Let's go ahead and put a breakpoint there and again test our application. Now that we've refactor it, it might not work. So let's go ahead and test it. Let's switch over to our simulator. Okay, so the breakpoint here. Now I haven't put any breakpoints in the buildings controller or the locations controller, um, the, excuse me, the buildings controller. So I don't know if the buildings have loaded yet. So let's just go ahead and step over that and see what comes back. And no, we don't have any elements in our array and this for loop will still work with that. So let's hit play and we don't have any pins on our screen and that's pretty bad. So how do we fix this? 
what happens is, let me go back to the building controller and let's just put a breakpoint here and let's see what the order of execution is for the for the sequence of our application. Okay, so our view actually gets loaded before our JSON objects get loaded. So how do we handle this? This is loading asynchronously. The JSON file is loading in the background and it's actually loading after our view is loaded. So how do we handle this? Well, the first thing that you may or may not think of is, well, let's just delay this loading until maybe a second or two after. And we can certainly do that. We can put a delay in here and wait a second or two, but you don't know if it's a second or two. It could be 30 seconds from now. And so the way that I like to handle this is using notifications. And so I did a video um, a couple days ago on the notification center. And so we're gonna use that in here and how this works. When this building, let's say in the buildings controller, remove this so you can see it. When it goes ahead and adds all these buildings, I want it to let my application know that it's added a building. Uh, let me see. So what I mentioned here is the reason I have this add building function is because I want to have additional code in here when this gets added. And I'm going to show you something. This is probably not the best way to do it, but I'll show you this anyway, and, and this will give you an idea of not only how to properly do this, but in future applications where you have something a little bit more complex, this is where you might want to do this. For notification center, we just type in notification center dot default center dot post, because I want to post a notification, meaning I want to let my application know and anybody that cares, any object that cares, that I have this event going on, namely that I've added a building to the array and to storage here. So it's asking for a, um, a notification. And so it's, I'm going to put in here an object. And so for the notification name, I can just type in NS notification dot name. And this is actually a constructor. So it's going to ask for a notification name and I'm going to call this notification name building added. Okay. But I'm going to pull this out and put it into up here. This is going to be oops, a public variable. And I'm going to call this, um, let's see. building, and I'm just going to put this all in caps, notification. Okay, so we have this just as a constant, so I can use this anywhere that I need to post that name or get that name. And the object that I'm posting is going to be that building. I don't have to do this, but as I said, I want to show you some a little bit more complex ways of working with Notification Center. Okay, so I've now posted that, but I don't have any listeners who are going to, to receive that notification. So this is the notification, it's just the type, and I'm actually passing along that up in that notification an object. And so in my view controller, what I can do is I can register for that, and I am going to, for now, comment this code out by holding command and forward slash just to quickly comment all those lines out. In my view div load, I am going to register to receive those notifications. Or in other words, I'm going to add myself as an observer to that notification. So how we do that is again, notification center default, add observer. And we have a couple options here. And again, if you want to go into more detail, I have a video on this uh, explicitly. I am going to use the, uh, the second one here and it's going to ask for a notification name. And that notification name is going to come from that buildings controller that I had. And so if I just type in buildings um, controller, or excuse me, buildings, building, what do I call it? Add, <laughs> I forget. Yeah, building added notification, excuse me. 
this is why I put these things into constants because I never remember the name. Uh, that should give me an error. What object do I care about? I actually don't care about a particular object, so I'm going to put a nil for that. It's going to pass me back an object, but if I wanted notifications on a particular object, then I could put that in there as well. I don't care about an operation queue. And for this one, yeah, we're going to get rid of this parameter and turn that into a... Um, uh, for this one, we're going to just add the block here. And so that parameter that gets passed in is notification. And I'll we'll close that block right there. So now that we have this block that is going to get executed when that notification comes in, I can now let that, instead of doing a for loop, I can just take that object that's passed in with that notification Uh, let's see, we have, oh yeah, okay, so I, I knew that was going to be an error, and the reason that's an error is because we actually have to do this, and let's see, let's, uh, public, static, to get the reference in another class, okay. So that fixed that. So now I can access that variable in another class. And the notification, this has, inside the notification, it actually has an object uh, as part of that. And that's that object that gets passed in um, for when I posted that notification. So we have this, and let's put this into a variable first. So let the, let's say new building, and this is going to be of type map pin. And we're going to typecast this as a map pin, and hopefully it comes back as a map pin, but you never know. I just built that just to make sure I got everything correct there. And now we have that map view, add annotation, passing in that new building pin. Actually, let me call it new building pin. because it's not just a building, but it is a pin or an annotation. You can call it whatever you want. And let's see what this is. Oh yes, again, self. I was afraid to do that inside the blocks. So again, this block is going to get executed every time that notification comes back. And so we can get rid of this for loop that's going to loop back every time. And instead what this is going to do is every time I add a pin, this notification gets called and it pulls that pin out of that notification and adds it to our map. Okay, we're not quite done yet. Let's go back and run this. Okay, so we have our Alamo Fire download JSON working. Let me go ahead and remove that breakpoint. But what I do want to do is put a, a breakpoint here and then also if we go back to our, our view controller put a breakpoint inside here, and I'm going to go play this. And so you can see now we're in this add building, and if we step up through our, our stack here, um, so here's our where we currently are, step back through the stack, you can see that this is where it's being called from, so building controller, add building. And so by stepping into that, we just go back through the stack, and here we are. And so we step over this line of code and it's going to post this notification with our building. So we're passing in this object with you know memory location B80 and it has Bronco Stadium blue turf. If I play over that, you can see now in our view did load, we have this notification, this callback in our notification for new building pin. Let's step over that. And indeed, we have that B80 with a memory address. So you know it's the same object, and expanding that we have blue turf, uh, Bronco Stadium blue turf with our coordinate, and our coordinate is right on the stadium, and that's perfect. I actually show you what the stadium looks like and why it has blue turf. So indeed, blue turf. It looks like even there's a game going on during that photo that was taken. All right, so now that we have that pin, we are adding it to the map. We hit play, and we're getting a call. Our map is still not loaded. It's not finished loading anyway. 
and we have another pin coming in that's being parsed by our for loop here. And so that's gonna get added. We press play to continue our code execution. And then we get another callback in our notification uh, observer. And so this one is going, if we step over this, what does this look like? It's a different memory address. It's the Morrison Center, which actually is not the basketball stadium. And here we go. So another pin, and then finally catching that pin through the notification and then adding that. And so if we now zoom in here, you can now see that we have these pins, okay? So that works perfectly. If we click on those, that works exactly as, as planned. And so that's a nice use of Notification Center to let our view know that these pins are now coming in from some other process that are going on in the background. If we look to, take a look at our table view, our table view still just has that test data. So let's tackle that next really quickly. Go to our table view, and inside of our table view, table view also has a um, if we I think we just type in FUNC and then the view did load that we can override here and it's gonna ask me yes I need to override that okay so in our view did load let's take a look at our view controller for uh, this view did load uh, obviously we need to add the super call first to the super class but we also want to duplicate this add observer because we want the same thing to happen so let me just go ahead and copy that. And so when new buildings are added, we want this table to also have rows added, right? So pins are added to the map, rows are added to the table view. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Um, so in our table view, I just pasted that in. So again, we just make sure that we're calling the super view did load, make sure everything's handled up there, all the things are being initiated, initialized appropriately. And we still have the notification center adding observer and we're still we still care about that building added notification and we're instead of adding a pin to a map view that doesn't exist what instead we want to do is add a um, a a row to our table view and the way that we do that is we can if we do self because we're in that block table view and so the table view what we're going to do is just do reload data and what that'll actually accomplish is it'll make sure these functions get run again and so if we have multiple objects inside our array then we can uh, go ahead and just populate that with an additional rows so right now we have three hard-coded but now that we have this buildings controller with actual buildings in it, we can directly get that number of buildings. So buildings controller, and we can do that shared buildings, that sh which will return that NS array. And then that'll return an NS array. And then on that NS array, we can do a count, and that will tell us how many objects are contained in that array. Okay, so that'll contain, that'll just return three in our example, or two if you only have two objects, or whatever, how many objects are in your, your table view. Now, when this comes in, when our first building gets added to the array, this will get called, and then at some time in the future, this will get called. And so initially, this might be zero uh, when this first table view loads, but then when this is called, this reload data, this might be one, it might be two, and so it'll say return two. Uh, this we're going to keep this one as one, but this one is going to actually get called twice. And so I don't want to just put in test here because that's not very meaningful, right? We actually want to go ahead and get the array. So I'm going to put this into a um, a little local reference. Just call it buildings array. And this is of type, I want to be explicit here, buildings array. And we know that comes back as a buildings array, so we don't have to typecast it. And we want to get the array index. 
So for example, if it's the first one that we come out of, we get the first object, so let's say zero, and then we want to get the uh, title of that object that comes back. Um, actually, I'm sorry, this array, um, let's pull out the object that we care about. And so again, if it's the first object, we care about that first object. So let's pull that out into its own array or variable, and that's of type map pin. And the way we do that is now we have the array. Let's say it's the first object here, and then replace this with that building. Now we can do the type, the title, the subtitle, or the coordinate. We want to populate that with, oops, I deleted it, the title, and that should work. Now it's it's going to complain about this one because, um, well, not only am I not typecasting it, but this is only going to return the first object. So let's actually take a look at what this looks like, just to, again, test to make sure everything's working. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. I'm going to put a breakpoint here, and I'm going to put a breakpoint here. All right, so we're going to see what the order of execution is on this. Actually, I'm going to put a breakpoint here as well inside of our view did load. So we have our buildings array getting called. I'm going to step over that. Now this is in our view controller. It's not in our table view, and I'm going to remove this because I don't know. I no longer care about these guys. Um, we're adding another building. Still adding that third building. And as you can see, none of the breakpoints on our table view got called because if we go over to our list view, it has not loaded yet. This view did load has not loaded yet until I clicked on the list. iOS lazy loads your view controllers. And so until I wanted to load it up, this never get called. Now that I've clicked on it, this gets called. Now we're adding an observer, but since we're not adding any more buildings, it doesn't get called. However, it's still loading that table view, and this table view will actually return, uh, if we actually step into this, it'll return this array, and it does look like our array does not have any objects in there. That's, that's interesting. And so I might have to debug that in a second. So this count will be zero. And indeed it is zero. And so we'll have to take a look at why that's not getting populated. And I think I know why, but let's just go ahead. Yep, so making sure that this array does indeed affect this. Um, oh, I think I messed this one up. Insert, um, okay, I'm just making sure that what I think is adding to the array is indeed adding to the array. Um, this is a variable. Okay, let me, let me put a breakpoint in here. Let's rerun this. So what's happening is my buildings array does not have any actual buildings in it, even though I'm adding one. So we're going to debug this here. So this building, if I hover over here, does indeed have a building. This array is null. Okay, so that's probably why. Um, that's interesting. So this one, that's null as well. And so if I go ahead and try to add that, this object is no longer null. Let's go step through that. Okay, so it still doesn't have any objects here. Uh, let's go ahead, I'm just gonna put in a quick fix here. If my buildings array is equal to nil, constructor for that, Okay, and then we should add that there. Oh, okay, so let's see. Uh, let, me, let me turn this into an array. Hopefully this doesn't 
break too many things. This is going to return an array. And this is going to be of type map pins. Use generics here. Yes, thank you. And actually, this is going to do that. And then finally, this should be buildings controller. Buildings array. Insert. Okay. Yes, let me just do an insert new element. Let me go ahead and do this. So, yeah, sorry. This is usually what happens sometimes is you want to refactor it, and now you got to figure out what to do. So I'm going to actually put this at the beginning of the array to make it simple. Well, let's just get rid of this. All right, so that's my thought process behind that. Let's see if that worked. Um, yep, this is breaking some stuff. And that's quite all right. I'm sure, let's take care of that for us. Thank you. I don't like any warnings or errors. Hopefully this still works. Okay, so we have our building here. And this building, yep, so it's populated. And our building's array has zero values. And we step over this. And now we have one value in that array. Okay, perfect. So a little bit of debugging. That's how that process works. Just sometimes you assume things are the way they are and they're not. So a little bit of debugging always goes a long way. Okay, so now we're back to where we started. We have those three pins there. We have our list view. It's going to get view did load. We're going to add that observer, but we're never actually going to get these callbacks at this point. We're going to hit the play button. And now it's going to ask us, how many rows in this section? We have one section, which we didn't put the breakpoint on. And so if we step into that and look at our variable, we have three values in there. So that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. Going back here, this is going to return three. And sometimes I get called a couple times. Now it's going to ask us for which cell do you want to display in that first element? And we're going to just step back, grab a cell, a reusable cell we're gonna get the array and so we can see that that has three values in it and we're going to then take the array at zero because I'll show you how to get that proper array index in a second we're gonna store that into a temporary variable here and we're gonna pull out that title which is to Morrison Center and play that one and again it's just gonna pull out the same object so that's all gonna return that first object so instead of zero, what we want to do, now that this works and I test it, is we're going to get the index path, and that's going to be the index of what row it's asking me for, but not quite. We actually have, we need to ask for the row because it also has a section in here that we can query. So if you have more than one section, you want to check the section first, and then from there, get the row as well. But we only have one section, so we can just ask for the row. Let's recompile this. Wait for our simulator to come back. Okay, so it's gonna add all those buildings, one, two, and three. Here's our map, it's loading. We switch over to our table view, and now our table view has uh, is now being loaded. It's gonna add that observer, but again, this is never getting called. So let's go ahead and remove that breakpoint now that everything works. And this seems to work fine, so let me remove that breakpoint. Again, it's adding each of those three cells. So let's step over this real quick. Now this index path has two indices. Um, it's gonna just be zero for this one. So building, take a look at this. Two Morrison Center, that's that first one. That's to be expected. The second row, or the first index, we take a look at that building is something different okay and so we're just going to play through this and here we go so we have all these different ones and i added these in reverse order when i inserted it into the array but that's okay it doesn't really matter 
So let me remove that because now everything works. Um, so the this as observer was never called, and that's okay. If we add a building later, then this will get called. And so through the execution of our application, this might get called later. But we can also test this functionality by going back to our storyboard, this guy here, and replacing the map with the list view as the first view. And so you'll see that we'll have to wait for that table view to get loaded. And let me go ahead and put my breakpoints back in. Oops, got so table view. We put these breakpoints back in here just to show you how this works. And where are we on the execution? That was back in the buildings controller. So step through that. Okay, post that notification. Now the notification is now being called because this is the first view. Our map hasn't been loaded. Step through that. It's going to reload the app, uh, reload the table view, but our table view actually hasn't been loaded yet, even if I put a breakpoint there. Now it is. If I go to the buildings controller, step inside of that, look at how many buildings array. There's only two in here currently. So stepping through that again, there's the third building being added. And now it's asking me how many table rows do you have in here? This is going to return three. And so what it's doing is every time a building gets added, it's going to refresh that data in that table view. And it's going to refresh these values as well. And so one, two, and three. So that has all those values in there. So that works if the list was our initial view. And if we go over to our map, which is now over here, click on this, you can see that our map does not does no longer work. And that's because we, we don't assume that this gets loaded later. So let's go ahead and fix that. And again, these are just nice ways of going through your application and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Our entire application assumes that this piece of line, these two lines get called as we go through, we get the notification, we pull the pin out, and then we add it. Now again, this doesn't get called because this gets loaded after all of our pins get um, added. And so we don't get these notifications, but that's okay because what we could do is go in here and say, um, well, let's go ahead and first get the buildings array. Gonna be explicit again that's just a type array and that is going to come from the buildings controller shared buildings okay so that now we have this and what we can do is we can say uh, actually we can just do a, a for loop here and I'm just gonna type this in again I just like to say that that's a current object in my buildings array, my local buildings array, uh, dot enumerated, and start that. Okay, so now we have this object. So let's go ahead and actually create a local building object. And this is going to be of map pin. And this is going to come from that current object as a map pin. And for this one, uh, just give me a second here. So for the map pin, or actually I should call it building pin. Uh, we don't have to use self here because we're not in a block. So map view dot add annotation. And we're going to add that building pin as the annotation. Okay, and then it's just going to say we need to Use the exclamation point, great. Okay, so we have two scenarios. One is the map gets loaded first before any of our map pins is actually ready, in which case if zero is ready, it'll get the array, this will be zero, our for loop won't execute, nothing happens, and then sometime in the future, we get notify, notified that each building is getting added to our array. And so then these populate our map. The other scenario is all of our pins have already been populated, parsed, and added to the array. This never gets called, but 
we already have those pins in the array. And so when this gets called, we have a buildings array that has three pins in it in this example, and we add those to the, the map. So let's take a look and see if this actually fixes our problem. So you can see that as I iterate through this application, you can see how I kind of go about handling all these huge steps. I break it into chunks and then handle each case and test and test different scenarios as I go. So this is for the table view. So all the table view stuff is getting inserted and reloaded. Okay, so there's our three table views. Now again, our pins are already loaded, so when we go to our map, and before I do that, I'll make sure I have breakpoints set in there. Um, so yeah, we'll move that down, just make sure we put one there as well. So when we click on map, now our map view controller has now loaded. We don't get any notifications because those are already taken care of, but in our for loop that we just created, we have an array, a buildings array that comes back as three objects and then we just loop through those objects we have a pin make sure that comes back as appropriate so yep there's the first one and the coordinate with our map boom right there great okay add that one to the map and i didn't put any breakpoints in there so that adds all three pins to the map now i hate having to zoom into this every single time that that we show the map. So let's go ahead and zoom in automatically to our map. And again, we're going to do this. Um, uh, we can do it both in here and in here, uh, excuse me, after these lines of code. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in regardless of whether we have pins loaded just for sake of simplicity. So I'm going to uh, just copy over some pre uh, predefined code that I already have set up. Okay, so what I've done is I have some I have some code here that I I will just type in for the sake of speed. But let's go through this real quick. We have a distance span variable that is a CL location degrees, and this is just two thousand. It's going to define essentially how far our map is going to show, and this is going to be about 2,000 meters or about two kilometers, exactly two kilometers. And then we have this BSU CS campus location. This is just a campus location with a very specific GPS location that I have defined. So again, this is just our 2D coordinate that we've created. And now that we have our, again, our map view, we're going to do what's called set region on that map view. And we're going to create a MK coordinate region um, object. And we do that with a make distance. So we pass in that GPS location. We give it that two kilometer span, both in the longitudinal direction and the latitudinal direction, um, latitude, longitude. And do we want to animate that? True or false? And I've chosen to animate that because it's a little bit more cinematic. Let's see what this does for our map. Switch over to our simulator and we have these breakpoints. I'm going to go ahead and remove these breakpoints because we know everything works in our table view. Hit play. We're going to, uh, I'll keep that. One, two, and three buildings getting added. Here's our table row set up. We know that works, so let's remove those breakpoints. Great. Now we switch back over to our map and again, all of our building pins are loaded. So that gets skipped over. Again, we don't have any breakpoints, but let's remove that. Now when these buildings get come, come back, there are three of them. So we already know that. Let's just step through there. And we already zoomed in. I guess you didn't see that animation, but that's how you zoom in automatically. All right, so now that we have this application a little bit more polished up, we're going to add another location here. So let's create a view controller class for that one. New file, Swift. And I'm going to call this just details view controller. I'm going to copy that text because when we do this, I can just do class paste. This inherits from the UI view controller because it doesn't come up. We didn't import the UI kit view controller. Here we go. 
and we have our view controller class set up now i don't want to have to copy and paste those in so i'm just gonna um let's see um i guess we can do the code complete for those it's not that hard so details view controller func view did load here and func did receive memory warning and eh, let's just go ahead and copy those in because I don't like to uh, mess with that one and oh I will just copy this one in so you did load okay and yes we need to override those okay perfect so we already have this set up now the view controller here is not set up on our main storyboard and that's going to be this guy so I'm going to run through this pretty quickly because it is not something that's too complicated so we're going to add this one is going to be our details view controller now that's hooked up so if we go to our assistant and click on the view here that view's not going to change let's do automatic okay perfect now we want a reference to this text field we're just going to call this name text field description text field put that right under here okay we have some space and for this one for the save button we're going to create an action so we're just going to call this save action so when that add button or save button is tapped we are going to grab the name string of type string from the name teal name text field this is going to be as a string object and actually does this come back as a string yeah it comes back as a string so just make sure i don't know we'll just be explicit about everything text field dot text that text is going to again come back as a string okay so what we want to do is create a new map pin of type map pin and this is going to equal that map pin constructor so we're going to pass in as a as the title the um, name let me hit escape so i can auto complete this so name string, next placeholder, this one's gonna be the description string. And for the coordinate, we don't actually have the coordinate because what we wanna do is when we add a building location is we wanna get the user's current location. So again, I have a video on how to do that exactly, but uh, for this one, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and test this. So I'm gonna hard code this first. So see a location coordinate we don't have that in here, so we need to import the map kit so that we can use the coordinate 2D. Here, and then there's a make function that allow us to create this. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is just do zero, zero, and then zero, zero, or actually better yet, I have a map coordinate that I could use right here. Okay, so type in those exact coordinates and make sure everything matches up. So now that I have this new pin. What do I do with that new pin? Well, I have a buildings controller that I can put that into because I don't have a reference back to the map view to add that directly, nor would I want to because normally what I would have to do is add annotations or add annotation, add that map pin there, and then I would have to get a reference to the table view and then i don't know maybe just do reload data on that and that's kind of obnoxious because i would have to essentially do different calls to every object that cared about it but because all those are set up with the notification center i can then say um, let's see so buildings controller add building and add the map pin there and so now when i add it 
all of our both our table view and our map view gets those notifications that I just added a pin, even though I'm in this details view controller. Uh, let me go ahead and, okay. Um, yeah, so these come back as strings. So I got ahead of myself. Okay, fix that up. Make sure all those errors are gone before moving on too much. OK, but that's all I have to do. So when I hit that save action, it's going to pull out the name from the text field, the description from the text field, and it's going to just auto generate that location, creating that new map pin and then adding that new map pin, not to any particular view, such as our table view or our map view, but just adding it to our table or to our buildings controller. And again, through the notification system, those two views will get updated automatically. So let's test this out. Uh, let's go ahead and compile this application, put a breakpoint here. And I think that's all we have to do for this guy. And I'll show you how to add an actual location of the user's device here in a second. So that's not hard coded. I'm going to keep that breakpoint in there. So we have three buildings coming from the JSON object. Okay. And we go over to our map view. There are the pins on our map view. I'm going to hit add. And I forgot to do one thing, but I'll show you in code that this indeed works. So the name, uh, I'm just going to type in new. Oh, okay. So I typed it in, but this didn't actually get typed in. So what we can do is we go up to hardware and through keyboard, we can do connect hardware keyboard and that'll disappear. But then we can actually toggle that again, toggle the keyboard. So that pops up. So at least it looks like what we have in case we hide any views any buttons or anything. So the name of the location that we're adding. And then down here with description, we're going to do the same thing. Just type in, oh, I don't know, just some junk there. And now hit save. And you can see that our save action is indeed getting called. We're going to pull that name out, make sure that's right. Yep, name of the location is what I typed in. The description string is just a bunch of junk. And then that map pin. So we take a look at that map pin click on the eye. Um, okay, so that didn't quite work out the way that I wanted to. Okay, because it's a map pin, not the coordinate. I was trying to get this guy. Okay, and that's exactly what we wanted to uh, look at. So that map pin is good. Now when we add that to the building um, buildings controller, you can see that that buildings controller gets added. And then what I want to make sure that we do now at this point is we have a map. This map view has a notification center observer, put a breakpoint there. And as well as our table view has a notification center, which just reloads the data, I'll put a breakpoint there so that as I go back to our details view, or excuse me, our buildings controller with our execution in here, we're going to post that notification and that's going to get posted and received each to our table view and our map view. So we go ahead and play through that. So here we are in our table view. Our table view got notified first. I'm gonna play through that. That's gonna reload our data. And then here are, is our map view. It's just called view controller, but that is indeed our map view. It's gonna get that pin that we just added and it's gonna add that pin to the map. So we hit play. And now we forgot to dismiss this view, which is kind of important because now we no longer can see our map view. So let's go ahead and fix that. And we're going to do that inside of our buildings controller. And we're going to say inside the save, dismiss, animated. Yes, I want that to be animated, so true. And then for our completion block, we don't really care what happens after that. So let's go ahead and run this really quickly. So this will just dismiss our view that is the current one, which is of course the details view controller. So one, two, uh, so we move these views. Okay, so our map three and three. So we're gonna add this, we just take in some stuff, hit save, this gets called. And we all know that this works. Um, so let's just play through that. And we have that building getting added. So let's play through that again. We're getting notified, great. And here's that fourth pin with all that junk in there with our three other pins. And if we go back to our 
table view. We now have this. This is obviously formatted really poorly, but you can see that this is the new row that got added. Of course, you can reorder these as, as you want. You just have to reorder the array that comes back. But there you go. So I've added a pin from this object and I've added it to the map, simultaneously adding it to the array. All right, so if I restart this application now, the app will not control, not contain that new pin. And so I wanna save that between different executions. These three rows come from the server. So I'm not so interested in saving those because those are always saved on the server, but definitely this one. And so one of the ways that we do that is with core data. And so uh, if you remember back from our list of topics that we were gonna cover, we were gonna cover core data, JSON parsing, which we've done, so check. Uh, location, I'll have to get the GPS location for you guys. Um, so we'll do that in a second. Maps, check. Table views, check. Notification center, check. Web services, check. Tab bar controller, check. So we just have two more, two more technologies to go over in this large application. So I hope you guys are still here with me and following along. I know this is a large application, but this is how real applications are, are created, at least by me. Um, I'm sure it's very similar for other people that have a lot of experience in developing these applications. Now, I've already added the core data library here, so I have this data model already set up. Uh, I sometimes like to use the uh, different editor style for this, but let's go ahead and add an entity. So for our pin, if you remember, we have a title, a subtitle, and a coordinate for this. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna actually create a different object that these get created to. You might wanna make these into an NS managed object so that you can save them directly to the database, but I'm gonna do it in one extra step just to show you kind of how that might work in generating those pins. So for this, we're gonna have a new entity. This entity is just going to be simply called map pin. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, you do not want to name it the same name as that guy. So we're going to call it um, map pin. Uh, I'm just going to be very explicit and call it map pin model. You probably don't want to add model to that. But again, I don't want to conflict with this already named. So differentiating between our database model and our class model. And normally these would be the same. But again, I'm going to show you kind of an intermediary step for this. So adding an attribute for this, we're going to have the pin title. This is going to be of uh, type string. Uh, add another attribute. This is going to be called pin description. And I usually don't name these title and description just without some kind of other identifier because sometimes like description is already taken as a function name on a lot of objects. And then finally we have, I'm just going to make this the pin latitude. And the pin longitude, pin longitude. Okay, so for the pin longitude and latitude, these are going to be double values. And that's our that's our object right there. That's all we need to do for this. These are all just the data points. Actually, I want to add one more thing. So let's go ahead and let's go back just to our editor because it's easier this way. We want to have a is user added flag because we want to differentiate between the fact that a user added this to the database or this came from the server in case you want to store the server information as well so we can just differentiate between those and that'll be a true or false depending upon if the user added it or not okay so we have this object this entity already defined. I'm going to go ahead and click on this one here and then go down to our code gen. And this is automatically selected to class definition. And what this allows us to do, and I and I didn't talk about this in the previous core data video that I did, but the class definition automatically creates a class for us. And so if I go into, uh, let's say our buildings controller, and we're going to add, when we add this building, I'm gonna insert it into the array, but I also wanna add it into our database as well. So if you remember from the 
beginning of the video, we have this database controller that I've just set up to allow us to access these methods and variables very easily. So if I go back and hit the back button there, I can say database controller. This is why we kind of separate our code into different places. Get context, insert, and then um, Actually, I'm so, let's see, what we want to do is insert a new entity into our, um, into our database, into our context. And so what we want to do is instead of this one, we want to say, um, let's see, well, let's go ahead and create that entity first. So I'm going to say, let new building entity again being very explicit about it this is going to be of type uh, what did i call it map pin model so with that code gen and that class definition it allows me to do this in the last video i showed you how to do a explicit subclass of it we don't have to do that anymore i do believe as of ios 10 and a lot of people left the, that note in the comments so thanks for pointing that out so we have this code generated automatically for us so that we can then say ns entity if i can spell entity description the reason that it's not coming up is because we need to add the import core data here. Okay, so NS entity description insert, and we have a few here. So new object is the one we're looking for, and it's asking for an entity name. And so the way that I do that is I like to create a class name for that. And so I'm just going to say let the, um, let's see, this is going to be a building class name. So let's add this up here. This is going to be a static variable, but it's going to be private. So let the, uh, let's call it, uh, we can do a, we can do a lowercase building class name. It's actually going to be the building pin. I always like to make my variable names descriptive so I know what the heck I'm talking about. And this class name is going to be a string. If you remember from my previous core data video, uh, this is how we do it. And so we generate the class name as a string by calling the class constructor on string, but using the describing and passing in that um, map pin model object. Okay, so I'm going to copy that. Uh, I do have, let's see, the error there. Oh, okay, actually, so no, the first, the other one was right. So this one is self to actually get the reference to the class. Okay, sorry about that. So string describing getting the class self kind of a reference to itself and that'll generate the class name. So instead of doing something like, oops, uh, hold on a second. Instead of doing something like map pin model and making a mistake like that, or if I refactor that string and change the class name, I just do that. And so that'll always change, be dynamic. Okay, so now it's going to ask me which managed object context I put that in. So we already have that reference in our database controller. We just call get context. Now we're, we're good. We've created this object. Um, okay, what is it asking? Oh, okay, typecast that coming back. Yep, okay. So perfect. So now we have this managed object, new building entity that we are going to insert into the database. And so the new building entity is its title or its pin title, I should say. And the reason I named everything pin title, by the way, is in my code complete, if I just type in pin, the top results come with all those attributes that I added. So pin title, and that's going to equal that building that's being passed in. It's gonna equal its title, a new building entity dot pin. And then let's say the description it's going to equal the building's description. Um, excuse me, the dual building dot description. Um, actually, what 
subtitle, excuse me, is on the pinned. New building, entity, again, pin. Now we have this latitude and new building entity, pin longitude here. Set these up with equal signs. Now we're gonna have to dive down a little bit deeper into our building coordinate dot latitude and building coordinate dot longitude. Okay, and so the reason I did this was just to illustrate the fact that we are taking some intermediary object or some object that's actually represented as a different data type, a map pin, and storing it in the database explicitly. So this is just a double. When we pull this back out of the database, what we'd have to do is actually um, reconstruct this. And so if we pull it out of the database, what we would do is create a building or a map pin and basically do this in reverse. Um, but I'm not going to go ahead and do that right now. And this is essentially all we need to do. What I could do is after creating that database object, I could just say database controller dot save context and that'll save it. But let's say I've, I'm calling this add building 30, 400 times in a row. I don't want to save that database every single time. So where this database save context gets called is in a number of places, actually only in one place, is in the application will terminate. And so once your application gets terminated, hopefully this gets called, but you never know. So sometimes what I like to do is also save it when it goes into the background, because that'll only happen once. And uh, real resign active, you can also do it in here as well. And maybe after, in that details view, after you've added the pin, I might want to do it here, as, but really you don't want to do it too many times. So it depends on where your application is creating these managed objects. You would want to save that context a little bit more often than just on application termination, but that's really up to you. You have to see how many times this is getting called. Hopefully not too many, but hopefully enough so that if your application just totally dies and gets killed, that we do save that context um, eventually. Okay, so let me just go ahead and just put that there. When I save it, it's going to add that building. Um, and let me just go ahead and put that right before the dismiss. Okay, so that's how to add an object that you download via JSON to a database. So we can check that off. Now, of course, I could go and query the database, but that's going to be a whole nother video because this video is already too long, but hopefully you get a sense of how all this fits together. Now let's take a, a, a shot at getting rid of this ugly, ugly, hard-coded location. Now for the location, and again, I have a video that specifically talks about this, but let's go through it in this application so you can see kind of my workflow, uh, how, to, how to get that started. So for this one, I need the, lo the user's location, and it would be nice to have that in multiple places. So I need that in the map view because maybe I want to zoom in to the map view instead of, again, into this hard-coded location. So I want to get the location here, and I also want to get the location in that details because again, we do not want to hard code this. We want to add a user location with a name and string and at the current user's location. So how do we do that? Again, if two objects need to share data, we put that into a third object. So we're going to create a third object. It's going to be a Swift file. We're going to call this locations controller. And that's why I didn't name the buildings controller locations. I'm uh, going to copy that, going to create this. And foundation's okay because we don't have any UI elements in here. Paste that in. This is going to be inheriting from the NS object, starting this class. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start this off as what we, we need to do is spin up that GPS. Where, so I'm going to say, uh, excuse me, this is going to be a class function. This class function is going to be called I'm just going to call it star, um, let's call it start GPS. It's not going to return anything. We're going to also have one called stop GPS. And actually, before I do that, I should clean up some of my code. 
Um, just, let's go through the code first and make sure that we have everything cleaned up. So the initial thing I, I, I see right here is the fact that we are adding a an observer, but we're not removing that observer. So let's do that clean up here. We can do that in the dinit function. So notification center, remove observer, and this is just going to be myself here as this class. I'm going to copy this. We're also doing that in the table view. So let's go ahead and do that as well because we're adding that observer. Uh, everything else looks good there. And again, this is my process. I kind of just go back through my code and, and look at all the different things that I've done. Um, okay, so we still have that hard-coded value. We have this hard-coded value, which I'll probably I should probably pull up, but again, interest of time, we're not going to do that. We have a couple things here. Okay, we're not done with that one. And for this one, we just we are just posting that. Make some room here so these functions don't blend together. Okay, we're just downloading that, fine. Table view already did. Okay, so that looks okay for right now. So let's go back to our uh, locations controller. So we have a start GPS, we have a stop GPS. What we also wanna do is a class function that gets the current user, or current location, excuse me, so current location. And that is going to pass back a location object. Uh, let's just call it the CL location coordinate 2D. The autocomplete isn't coming up because we don't have that core location in here. So core location. Just hit escape at the end of that variable name. Hit enter. And there you go. So it's going to return that. And again, I am going to hard code this so everything works. So CL location coordinate 2D make and for these values, I'm just going to pass in those hard-coded values. I'm going to cut those out, go to controllers, and then just simply paste in those values. Okay, so we have the coordinate. And let me get rid of this extra space here. Okay, so I'm going to ask the location to, or I'm going to ask for the current location, which is going to pass back the hard-coded values here. Start GPS, stop GPS is going to ask the uh, location manager uh, how to do that. So um, what we want to do is actually call these as soon as possible so that the location is ready to go as soon as possible. And the way that we do that, because it's a class function, is we just call um, this. So start GPS. And then what you want to do is when this comes back, uh, becomes active again. We also want to maybe start that GPS. We also manage sure that the the GPS gets stopped at some point. So stop GPS here um, and maybe here as well so that we're not running that all the time. Obviously that method isn't filled in yet but we'll get to that in a second. So for our view controller, because we no longer have, well, we no longer need this make 2D, we can say locations controller current location. Okay, so that get the current location. The problem with this is the current location might not actually be available. And so this will come back as null. And so we want to actually make sure, not null, but um, empty. And so let's see, actually it could be come back as null. So let's say if BSU location is nil, or excuse me, is not nil, then go ahead and zoom in on that. But what happens if our location comes back later? Well, we'd set up another notification for that, and we can probably go ahead and do that. In the interest of time, I might not have time for that. Let's see what, how we work out with here. So again, locations, controller, current location. Okay, and that'll pass back that coordinate 2D object that we need. Perfect. Well, so how do we actually get this location? Well, let's go ahead and start typing in um, location manager. So we have a sale location manager object that we can start to um, 
well, start monitoring. And we'll say that we need a location manager and we can say self on this one. But as soon as we do that and we build the code, it'll say use of instance member start monitoring of type sale location manager. Did you mean to use the value sale location manager instead? Um, no, what I actually meant to do was say that this class is um, adheres to the protocol of the location manager. So if I type in location manager, delegate, now we have access to um, a couple of these classes that get called. So let's type in location manager. So here are all the ones that we have that we're interested in. So see how location manager uh, did update locations. This is the one I'm interested in. So when a new location comes in, I want to actually check for that location and say, let the current location, this is going to be of CL location type. This one is equal to the locations. And I'm just going to grab the first location that comes out of that object. And this is going to get represented by a static current location. We're going to set this equal to nil initially. This is going to be of CL location type. Um, yes, I need to. <laughs> uh, let's see, now we're going to reset this a couple times. So this is going to be a variable. So a static variable, current location. And this is no longer a um, here. Okay, so uh, I got a bunch of errors here. Let me just work through one thing at a time. Let's start at this guy. So cannot nil cannot initialize specific type sale location. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. And we'll worry about that in a second. And this one that's getting returned. We don't want to hard code this anymore. Actually, I'm going to comment this out, and I'm going to return instead that current location object. Let's build this to see what fails. Okay, we still got that. Uh, start monitoring and type of, did you mean? Uh, let's figure that out in a second, sorry. And then seal location. What is the error here? I expected, oh yeah. Um, syntax is all wrong. Okay, so what I was doing here is trying to stop the monitoring. This would be self. But we don't actually have a location manager, so let me set this up. So static, uh, this is gonna be a constant. Okay, so CL location manager, and instead of this one, we use this. It's a static member, so we can go ahead and use that in a class. And yep, add that parameter back in, and probably the same thing here. Location manager, and then add that back in there as well for self. And what's our error here? Redeclaration of current. Oh, okay, yeah, so let's just do, uh, let's just call it device location, and that'll return the current location. Current location is a static member, so what's the error here? Oh, okay, because yes, this is a CL location. So we're asking for a CL location coordinate, so all we have to do for this one is dot coordinate, and that'll pass back this type. And then uh, let's see for this error. Okay, so I forgot to do one thing. Uh, I put the self as the, uh, uh, for this one, I didn't actually have to do that. So let's just go back and say, when I start to, when I want to start the GPS, what I want to make sure is that that location manager that we created had that delegate equals self. 
And then um, when we stop it, uh, we can keep that as well. So here self is saying cannot assign the controller type to manager delegate. Um, and that's because we want to make sure that we have an instance of this location controller. Uh, let's see, shared location controller. All right, so we don't actually have this variable, so let's set this up as a static variable. It says of type locations controller, which is obviously the same type here. And this is just going to equal locations controller and then the constructor for this. Now we can set, because we're in a class function, we can do this. Okay, and that'll re represent this guy here. The other thing we need to do is set up the location manager, uh, the accuracy, the desired accuracy, I should say. And let's see, uh, we can have these constants that start with a K and then see a location accuracy to narrow these down. Um, I'm not going to really need the best, but yeah, let's just go ahead and do best. Uh, I was going to use more resources and, and battery power, but that's okay. This is on a simulator. Choose what you need. And we need to do, I'm sorry, start monitoring location is what I needed to do there. Okay, so once we have all of that set up, and hopefully I, I worked this correctly with the class and static variables, sometimes a little tricky like that. Stop updating, excuse me. Okay, so there we go. We have those uh, appropriately filled out. I can now delete this. If you are asking me for the device's location and that's null. I don't actually want to return that. So uh, let me actually undo this. Um, no, let me, okay, yeah. So I was just thinking of a problem that I have yet to run into. We'll get there in a second. So if that current location is equal to nil, again, maybe I should say not, go ahead and return that else. So otherwise return and for this one I'm just going to say seal location coordinate 2d make just return zero zero for that one and let's see what do you want from this one sure you say so Xcode we'll do that and then finally yes we want um, the locations controller static location or actually we should do uh, this is a static variable so we can probably just do it that way Let's just build that make sure uh, yes static member okay so yeah we're gonna have to put the class okay that's right all right so that's hopefully going to allow us to start the GPS. Let's put a breakpoint in there. That'll get called. Let's do a stop just to see if that ever gets called. Um, device location. And when the updates get called, let's see the order of operations for here. Uh, actually, let's see if we have errors. We do have errors. Yes, okay, so for this one, it's saying we don't have that anymore, current location, because I renamed that device location. And then finally, this one was also not current location, it was device location. Okie doke, that looks pretty good. We have an error here. Let's just go ahead and fix that warning if we can. Oh, okay, so this one. Um, okay, so we've we put in zero, zero for those values. So if the latitude is not equal to 0, 0. Let's put a breakpoint there just to make sure, see if that gets called. Okay, let me close that and let's run this and see how we can debug our application. And hopefully everything just works, but actually there is one thing I have to do is I did not actually tell the 
the app that we're going to use this. So start the location. This is probably going to not get called or uh, not actually work. Uh, so let me stop that real quick because I already know that's going to be a problem. So when I start that location and start updating location, I actually have to ask the user for permission to do that. All right, so the way that we do that is we actually have to ask the user here um, and we are going to do that if we scroll down here. I don't remember off the top of my head what it is. Request always authorization is what I was looking for. And that way when it executes this line of code for the first time, it'll pop up a, a authentication for the user to allow your application to start recording its GPS location. We have to do one more thing before setting that up. Uh, we go to the info P list and somewhere that's not one of these disclosure arrows, we hit a plus on and we just type in permission or privacy, excuse me. And this autocomplete is not coming up. Huh, autocomplete's not coming up. So we just want to make sure we go down to the privacy settings and for the location usage description always usage description is what we want and again that's covered in the other video this is going to be a string I'm just going to type in hi I'd like to use your location to add new buildings to the map okay so that's just the description that pops up. Now that I've added that always request always authentication or authorization, this should pop up when we hit that line of code on our simulator. So here's our simulator. We get the start GPS. Where is that being called from? We can go back up the stack and see that it is being called in our finished and launch, uh, did finish launching with that options. So that's pretty cool. So it's getting called right away and we're going to hit play. Now, where is this one being called from? This is actually becoming called from application did become active. And that's okay if we call this multiple times. Just be aware that sometimes your application or your method will be called multiple times. And that's okay if we just set the uh, delegate and the accuracy and the start updating location multiple times. But maybe we don't want to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and let that play for right now. But again, that is being called twice, so be aware of that because that might cause some bugs. So we've added the buildings because those have been downloaded and we have a crash. So, all right, so we get to debug this application. All right, so I noticed that we have a runtime error here with our database controller. Now, this is a copy and paste error that I had in here because usually what I would do is I would bring this in either from another project or from a code snippet. Now the copy and paste error that we have is that these databases is not called databases. This is from a previous project. I just copied and pasted in here. So the problem with this is it's looking for a persistent container named databases. But if you look in our source file here, we have a buildings data model. And so we actually need to load the buildings data model, not the databases. And so I'm just going to simply type in buildings. Now this will alleviate any issues that you have with your view context coming back as nil or something, some kind of weird Xcode error that you might have run into. So let's go ahead and compile this and take a look at our application. Okay, so we have our application here. You can see that we have our pins loaded from our web services endpoint that we have, basically that static JSON object. And if I zoom in here far enough, you'd be able to see that those are multiple pins. Now when we add our own location, and I'm going to actually change the location just so you can see it being different from where we have it currently. So I'm going to hit Apple's location, which is right outside San Francisco. And I'm going to type in Apple and the description of the pin. And I'm going to hit save on that. And now you can see that we have this new pin added here. And if we go to our list, this is our, our table row here, which is bumped up across the top there and then our other objects that come from the web service. All right, so this is our application. Now it's not 100% done and you can probably see some room for improvement, such as adding an add button to the table view controller or actually pulling those items back out of the database when the application loads. We'll actually be handling a lot of that different stuff in future videos, so make sure you're subscribed to get those videos. Like this video if you liked it and wanna see more. And make sure you let me know what you think about it in the comments below. If you'd like to see me do another application of a different sort, let me know in the comments as well. And we'll put that on the list of videos to do in the future. 
Thank you very much, and I hope you found this video useful. We'll see you next time. Thanks.